so I was, um, I was chatting to you know, in the area, right? Uh, and uh, it turns out we're almost, we're almost catching up with the MIPS tutorial. And so I guess that the worst of our fears is, uh, is over and done with. Um, it's one of the reasons why I suggested that we, we have like some sort of practice session today is because I had actually anticipated that um, we weren't going to be able to catch up in the tutorial sessions so much as that we'll be able to cover most of the, uh, the, MIPS, the MIPS lecture series uh, tutorial sessions, but it turns out that won't happen. So we might as well just uh, proceed as scheduled, I think. This is weird, I don't know why. Huh. Um, sorry? Why what? Why won't what happen? Well, because we need to catch up on the lecture series. Sorry? Now we're behind. Yeah. We won't be able to finish by the 20. If we store, because the plan was to store, if we decide to store, we won't be able to finish by by the 25th, which is the last day of class. Right, if we continue, do you, have, you, have you been counting the days? Is, there isn't really that much time before we get here now, is there? So, so what I'm suggesting we do is we're gonna proceed as, um, as scheduled with this lecture series and then, um, and then see where that takes us. Because the goal is to make sure that we, we finish this lecture series and the next one before the, the fourth. The worst comes to the worst before the 11th, before we write the test, because it turns out the test is supposed to cover, um, it's, it's supposed to cover this lecture series and the data path and control lecture series. Um, wait a minute, what was the, uh, what, oh, no, no announcements, I guess. Um, what was the, what was the assignment about? Huh? What was the quiz about? The quiz. It was on branching? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, it is, there is a question. Are there, are there people that are still, seeing as we've canceled the practical session, are there people that are still struggling with branching? Conditional branching and um, unconditional branching. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what are you struggling with? What did you try? No, she's struggling, right? Sorry? Can you hear me now? Oh, ah, well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know what's happening to my ears. Can you hear me now? Okay, fine. So I was asking if there are people that are struggling with unconditional branches or unconditional branching and conditional branching. But I mean, this is what we discussed in the last uh, or previous lecture series. So question is, are there people struggling with that? Okay, well, what are you struggling with? Okay, before we transition to loops, I guess, let's, um, might as well just, maybe just quickly walk through these two, the, the question he's asking about. His question is, uh, how do you go about doing this, right? We kind of walked through this briefly, but if people are struggling with this, let's just do it piecewise together, right? We're saying, <coughs> excuse me. The question says we write an assembly language program that does this. Yeah, it, it does a whole bunch of things here. Um, prompt for an input school, uh, an input score from, from, well, for test. For ICT 11, 11, 10 test number two, might as well make this test number three since test number four is coming, and classifies it as either being an A plus, an A, B plus, B, C plus, C, D plus, or a D, right? I mean, so the, the thing here is just the logic. And where do you start with the logic? You start by identifying exactly where the thresholds are. 
where the thresholds, they're there, you know that, right? Each school at UNSA has its own thresholds. These thresholds were discussed in the first lecture series that we had uh, back in February, can't remember the day. Um, but we, we sat there in UNSA Sec 2, right? We sang about these different thresholds here. So this is a starting point, right? For you to implement that logic, you need to know what it is you're gonna be working with. And in our case, we are essentially working through and where are we now? Oh, wow. Remember this? We had class, we first met, we crossed paths on February 18th, and we had a discussion about this. This is the threshold we're talking about. So for you to implement that, you need to know this. Question then is how do you incorporate because what we're dealing with is essentially just conditional branching. So how do you incorporate these thresholds so that you print these different grades? That is the question. Right, so you have this information, uh, you go back to your question and you realize that the question is asking for a couple of other things, right? Besides you classifying the grade, you want to interactively get the value from the user or the student hopefully one of you guys, right? So we, we start with the usual, right? We shall save this uh, grade classification or something. ICT 1110 grading.asm, save that, right? This is, uh, this becomes second nature now. Um, Right, so we must prompt user for input. What else do we do? Well, prompt the user for input, classify grades. In fact, what you would do, uh, classify A plus, classify A, Classify B plus, you know the drill, right? Classify B, classify, what else is there? C plus, classify C, classify D plus, and then classify D. Is my voice still not audible enough or something? I should be speaking on a, on a much higher thing, right? What, 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 did, what did we discuss? During sound encoding, what's what's that? How how do we work on sound? Forty-four thousand one hundred is now what I'm speaking on, right? Anyway, so <clears throat> this is what we must do to implement this. Prompting for input from a user is pretty easy, right? We want some descriptive text, one, two, three, four, where we will say input string or something. And then we just say uh, enter your score. This is a string. So what's pro prompting here in line number eight, we say we load into V0, we load into V0, four, because it's a string, we want to print that string, enter your score. Now we know the drill here, load address is zero, into var input string, Cisco. Like I said last time, when you're writing some, a somewhat complex program, a program that spans multiple lines like this case, you want to test it out every time you write a chunk of code. Like in this case, we know enter the score works just fine. What else do we do? We now prompt for the actual integer because this is just a string we are printing. How do we prompt for an integer? Um, we use Cisco system call code number five, yeah? When the user enters the value, we know this will work. We run this, when the user enters the value, I enter the value five, we know that this five is going to be put where? A zero. So what we must do is we must move it from A zero to a safe place, a safe register. 
Take your pick, T0 to T, T what? T0 to T7, right? Or register eight up to 15, register 24, 25. Hey, if you want, use the saved registers, right? Nobody cares. So we're gonna push, we will push the value because once the user is prompted for input and they enter the value, that value is going to be in V0. So you want to move it from Z, V0 to, to a safe place. In this case, we've decided we're gonna move it to T0 or register number eight, right? Um, where are we moving it from? From V0. Now you can test it out here to try and see if the chunk of code in V0 is gonna be moved there. You run this thing, enter, well, I guess I got 33 or something. Um, you go to T0, did I enter 33? What did I enter? This is the problem here, what are we doing wrong? Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. The Lord is there with us. Um, yes, they saved us, right? No, but it's not, still. <laughs> did I put 33 here? Yes. No, I ended, oh yes, I did, thank you. Yeah, sorry for that, confusion, right? Um, debugging, it's always nice to pair program, right? Right, so the, the thing here, right, that in line number 15, something else I wanted to explain about the move here. I had a very interesting chat with people last, uh, the last time we met. I was telling them that when you say move from V0 to V8, V0 v, v, v to register eight, doesn't mean that you're literally moving, it's like you're copying the value. It's not the actual move you are, you, are, you are used to, where if I say I move this remote control, I move it somewhere else, it won't be here anymore. But in this case, if you check the CPU status, you'll notice that V0 still has 33. Eight has 33. So you're, you're making a copy, essentially. Move copies, right? Just wanted to point it out. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've prompted for this, this string from the user and you know it works just fine, what do we do? We classify. But before we classify, we must, uh, well, I guess classification would define the thresholds themselves. We classify. How do we classify? We must branch. Classification is going to be based on branch. I want to say, if, you, if your, your grade classification falls within the A plus range, we print A plus, right? So you notice that before you even start printing A pluses, you must define labels that are going to be used to hold these values, right? Var A plus. Right? Yes. Sorry? Well, for now, we are simplifying things. We're not really going to calculate the percentage. What, what he's asking is, uh, it, it, calculating the percentage is as easy as what? Score over total times 100. If we wanted to expand this question um, to deal with, uh, to deal with uh, what do you call this? To deal with percentages, we could do that. In fact, we, we've simplified this question. We are assuming the score that you're entering is a pre-computed percentage. Do you understand where he's coming from with this? His assumption was that the score that you enter here, when you're asked enter the score, usually our tests are out of 50. His assumption was that if the score is out of 50, then there has to be an intermediate step where we compute the percentage. Because in actual fact, these grades are tied to the percentage. It's out of 100, right? You're working with a zero to 100 range. So if we're saying our score is out of like, 50, if we're assuming this was out of 50, then we'd have to perhaps just multiply by two. Or if it's not out of 50, maybe it's a quiz, it's out of 10, it's a score over the total, which is 10 times 100. So you notice that at that point, you're, you're really working with different operations or instructions. Mod, div, right? And in fact, it gets a, a bit murky here because it's possible that your percentage score will, will have like a, a decimal part, right? I mean, seeing as we're dealing with integers, I mean, there could be like a workaround here without, you can 
easily say, you know, you're, you're rounding off to the nearest, is it the nearest number if it's, if the, 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 the remainder is more than five, then you just add a one to the quotient. That can be implemented without a problem, right? This logic. But in this particular question, we are assuming the input is out of the 100. You're entering your percentage score, right? Okay, so percentage score, you know, A plus, right? Um, we're gonna have A. Just lining this so that uh, Guys, is this making sense? We're gonna have B plus B. We're gonna have C plus C. Yeah, we're gonna have D plus D. Now I'm just copy pasting here so that we don't waste a lot of time. Is this making sense now? Um, so we have all the labels that we need for us to be able to print out the output so that the user knows whether the score they got corresponds to an A plus or a D, or everything in between, right? Now that we've done this, right? The question is, how do we go about classifying these? If we're, if we're using conditional branches for us to classify the different grades here, the question is, what do we do? We just have to identify the appropriate, the appropriate instruction to use for us to branch. But before we do that, we know that branching involves certain key parts, right? The things that you're comparing against each other and the label. There is something that we've deliberately left out from our discussion. Here's a question. B and Q, branch if not equal, what type of instruction is it? We've been following. Deliberately left out, to, because this, this stems out of our discussion of the three categories of instructions. B and Q, what type of instruction is it? Don't know. No. If you, B and Q, how many, how many instructions does B and Q take? Oh, Christ. Whiteboard mark. How many instructions does B and Q take in? If we had a B and Q here, there would have to be a register, right? Let's say it's register eight, register nine, and a label. I mean, how would, how would this, think about the 32 bits you'd be working with. How would you really slot in this? Anyway, I just thought I would, I would, I would point, point out these are things to think about. If you remember what I said, I said that uh, once you assemble this program, right? Once you assemble, once you compile, once you assemble this program, this is going to be an address in memory. Instruction, register, register, immediate value corresponding to the address. Yes? Then, uh, in fact, we haven't, we will, but we haven't got into the stage where, where, um, where we started putting in the logic classify the different grades here. I was just trying to remind people that this discussion is coming from somewhere, right? We should remember that, you know, there's these different instructions for, for in either one of the three categories. R format, I format, J format. And really, if you look at an instruction and look at the different arguments that it takes in, you should be able to know what sort of, what sort of instruction format it is, right? Not J, not R. Uh, okay, so the next step, right, is before we start classifying, we must make sure we have labels. Because what we're going to be doing once we classify all these different, all these different grades is, if we classify it as an A, we need to branch to the part of the code that's going to be executed. 
In this case, once we classify that it's an A plus, we must branch to a part that's going to print out A plus. Branching means you must have the correct logic and the corresponding label. So how do we, how do we classify an, an A plus? What is an A plus? It's a number that is between 90 and 100. So how can we do this? Branch if greater than, pseudo instruction. Branch if what greater than? Branch if the input value, in this case is gonna be an eight, right? Is gonna be greater than? We don't know, which is why we must define the value that we're going to compare this against, right? So in this case, sorry, well, we can just say 89 here. So, so for, for, this particular, for this particular condition, what we're saying is we're gonna compare the input value from the user with 89. If the input value is greater than 89, then it's going to be an A plus, right? Um, so we are saying if the input value which is in register eight is greater than what is in register nine which is 89, then we must branch to a label which we're going to give like a, a very intuitive name, label A plus. Right? But because we are saying we are going to branch to label A plus, this label must exist. Whenever you are working with unconditional branches and conditional branches, whatever you are branching to must exist. It must have the same exact name as what appears against the conditional or un uh, unconditional branch. So whenever you see someone write something like label A plus, there must be a label with the same name. Remember this is user defined, you write this name, you come up with this name, if this was X, there must be an X label, it must be a unique name, an X label somewhere in your code, right? So in this case, because we are saying the label we're going to branch to is going to be called label A plus, we must have a label. Now, for me, uh, I mean, I would prefer to have these at the same indentation, lab, uh, indentation level here. <clears throat> so label is called label A plus. Question, what do we do in this label? All we do is we are printing a string. Which string are we printing? A plus. So if we're printing a string, we're gonna say we load this into V0, printing a string is four, what string are we printing? A plus. And then we issue this call. Right, at this point, we could probably just do a simple check to see if this is gonna work. We'll load our small little program, run it, and just enter a range within 90 and 100, right? 91, A plus. Right? I mean, if you, want, if you wanted to, you could probably um, uh, run this again, I guess, and then uh, enter score, let's say, one. I don't know who would get 1%, but one. It's something wrong with our code, which is why it's still executing anyway. Do you understand why it's still executing? We didn't exit main, right? Thank you. But we'll fix that uh, at, at, at a later stage. I guess for good measure, we might as well just do it now, I guess. Um, we, we, we brought up the notion of making sure that you exit your program. If you have multiple labels, because the entry point of your program is always the main label, by definition or by convention, you must make sure that you exit the program appropriately, right? Using system call code number 10. So if I run this, uh, if, I, if I load this and run it again, and I enter one, nothing will be printed. Why? Because we are exiting, we are, we, are, we, are, we are checking against whatever is in main, and then uh, once we get to the end point of main, we terminate the program. It's done. Right. Okay, so you notice now, right, that if you can do this for A+, plus, you can do this for A, C+, plus, 
D plus, D, D plus, right? No problem. Sorry? Same process. For, for you to classify A, what you need to do is specify what you're classifying against. What is the threshold for A? 80 to 89. Right? Yeah, so you just say 79. BGT, dollar sign eight, dollar sign nine. Label A. Since it's what? This, this is the thing here. So the reason why order is important when you're doing these, these checks is, is that if you think about it, if you enter a value that doesn't fall within the, if you, if you enter a value that, I, I know the argument here, oh, we want this line between 30 and 32, won't, won't, it, uh, won't it be classified as an A plus? Is that the question? It won't. Well, it won't because the first condition will, will, We'll, we'll capture it. This is why order is important, right? You see, this is best understood if you're walking through, from a mental picture, right? So if you want to, let's say, work with 81, once you execute your program, the first thing it will do once, once you get to 24 here, it will come here, 81, right? It will come here, eight will be, 81 will be an eight. You come here, you load 89 into nine. It will be 81. Is 81 greater than 89? It won't. Uh, so so uh, I know it, is, is, it won't, right? So it, will, it won't execute this. It won't branch here. It will come here and check. So this is, this is, why, this is why order, or like following a predefined order is important. Like if you wanted to do it the other way around, you'd be, you'd be checking it against like different conditions. If you wanted to start with the smallest, going to the largest number. Guys, and I feel bad that we're almost like we're learning, we're learning these basic programming things when, make no mistake, we're not here to learn how to program, right? Let's not lose focus of why we're doing this. We're just doing this so that we understand what's going on behind the scenes. We're not interested in the programming thing, although it's nice though. Yes? Um, when creating the label, are we supposed to, is it, is it all in the class that we're supposed to write the class in two? No. As, as long as, if you've gone through the reference documentation, the book that the MIPS, uh, the, the book, the de facto book we're using for this lecture series, there's a small little part that tells you um, Characters that are allowed when you're coming up with labels, with names with, of variables. As long as it conforms to that, it could be your name. You can give this label your name, it will work. But the thing is, you want to always make sure it's something descriptive, something that is linked to what you're doing at that point in time. Like if you read this label A, you know that it's, I guess it's associated with an A or something. Could, this could have been label grade A or just grade A or something, right? So it's not a must. This is user defined because it's user defined. It's open season. You can name it whatever you want to name. Yes. Here. This. You you have to. If you don't close this, then it will. Everything that is below that level is going to be executed. So you have to. Yes. So after, in here, what, what, what Kapembo is saying is, in here, what she's implicitly telling us is, we forgot to, to exit gracefully here. So v, dollar sign V0, uh, 10, and then Cisco. This must be done for all the labels that you have. Again, A plus is easy, we branch to A, so we must have a label A, which should have the same content as A plus. So I'll just copy, the, copy paste this because we're running out of time here. The label here is not A plus, it's A. The thing we are printing is not var A plus, it's var A. What is var A? Var A is A, right? So you notice at this point in time, this stuff we're doing is, is the same thing really. So if we are to load this and just execute it, 
and I enter a number that falls within the threshold we're interested in, in this case, like 83%, it's an A, right? So I, I guess you, you now, you understand what's going on here. You come under the classification for a B plus, all you need is a threshold, you're gonna go to B plus. What is this called? Oh, we don't have a label B plus, so we're gonna go to B plus. But a B plus has a threshold of? Sixty-nine, right? Do you understand what's going on here? You come down here, and then you're going to have a, a label called B plus. But this is have to be B plus because we have a B plus uh, text up there, right? Um, again, for B, it's the same stuff. Do you understand what's going on here? I'm just copy pasting. This is sad, our purpose in life is to write this code, assembly language code. Wow. <laughs> and then C plus, what is the threshold for C plus? 49. Is it? 59? It's 49. Oh, for, we forgot a B. This, this B here, 59. And this is 49. C plus. Listen, I'm just gonna copy paste these things here so that we, we, we start talking about more important things instead of this, right? Um, classify C. C is, what is C? 44, right? What is D plus? D plus is uh, 39, right? What is D? Hmm? 40. Thank you for saying zero. Hmm? Yeah, what I, uh, yeah. Because you're trying to capture everything between zero and 39. Yeah? Okay, uh, so the, the next thing we do here is just to make sure that we have the labels that we need so again, we come here and then we're gonna say, this is C plus, C plus. This is C, this is C. This is, oh, garbage. This is D plus. D plus, and then we have a D final, <laughs> and D. <sighs> Guys, is this fine? Now if we're to just check to see if, uh, if it's working, we just run this, and I'll enter two. And this is the thing, I mean, so, so the, the thing that will teach you is, uh, you know how to to write uh, next year whoever is going to be teaching you the programming course as this notion whole notion of creating appropriate test cases so in this case what you would you'd have to do if you are writing this yourself is you come up with test appropriate test cases that uh, take into account all the different things that you're working with so numbers you want to test out for within the different ranges including those around the boundaries because usually you, you tend to make logical errors when when working with numbers on the boundaries, the thing that falls on the boundary of a C and a C plus, right? So testing it to be 
would, be, would, would have to take into account all those different things. You, there's, there's a process you follow really when creating test cases. But in this case, we just uh, check for a D plus and then maybe, oh, what is a 41? Don't know, right, D plus. Okay, guys, is this, hi. Yes. When you are when you are accepting textual content, if if whatever whatever logic you're working with requires a user to type in text, your name, your mother's maiden name or something, then you must use system call code number eight. Right? For you to use system call code number eight, you pre-allocate space where the string you're going to enter is going to sit in memory, which is why you use the data type space. Now you 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 allocate space in the in the data section. Oh, come on. Uh, well, we can t take it offline. Let's not confuse the flow here. There's an example thing that we shared, right? It was on the it's it's probably on the edit the collaborative editor here. <clears throat> we can take it offline, right? Is that fine? Or remind us via email and then we'll write the program with the source code if the source code is missing so that people know. But, but something I wanted to point, to draw attention to here, guys, is uh, this works just fine. But observe, right? And re refactoring of code, we'll probably only discuss this once we look at procedures. But if, if, you, if you analyze our program, especially starting from line 66, 67, 74, 75, 82, 83, 90, 91, 98, 99. Have you noticed something here? They are the same things, right? So instead of you doing things over and over again, why can't we say, let's take advantage of unconditional branching? and say we are going to create a label called label exit, where we shall have this V010 and Cisco. And everywhere where we have this stuff, we'll just say branch to. Right, I mean, uh, you're cutting down, observe, right? We had like 126 lines of code, but there we go. I was just trying to showcase, uh, because we, we've, we've, on, we've just been discussing conditional branching. I sat aside here and I'm thinking, let's look at an example that uses unconditional branching so that people understand like different, uh, I mean, how you could potentially use this thing here, right? Is that fine? <clears throat> Actually, you can even do this here as well, in the main. So now we have 118, and then we can just run this and um, 4, D, right, we exit without a problem. If, if somebody wanted to put? How do you mean? Instead of running it over and over again? Yes. Oh, so this is why we're going to discuss loops, right? What he's asking, right? If you notice, uh, I don't know if you understand his question. His question is, if I, when I'm testing this small little program here, um, every time I want to test it, I run it. I'll type O42, enter, and then I'll have to run it again. His question is, this is retarded, why not, if I, what if I, I'm, I'm the user and I type in the wrong thing and I realize, oh, this is wrong. And you just go in a loop. We're going to discuss loops, right? This is a, like, these are common programming uh, constructs. So you, you're gonna loop, you can write your program in such a way that it will go in a loop until a user signals the fact that they want to exit. Yes? You understand what I mean? Yes? I just want to understand on the core code, like where exactly are each of the core codes supposed to be applied? Like, for instance, in the example given, I should only use four in case for 
No, we also used five. But, but so, so where to use them is, is dependent on, on what sort of problem you're trying to solve, right? Which is why, as a person who is writing these things, you shall have access to this. Oh, wow, where are we? Oh, it's another thing, right? Someone is hungry, they're yawning. I don't know why, but. So, so which, which, which system core code to use is dependent on what problem you're solving. So if you're, you'd have access to something like this, if you want to print an integer, then you know that you'd, you'd be using uh, um, system core code one. If you're printing a string, it's four, which is why we're printing all those strings. The label, the A, A plus is a string, right? A is a string. Uh, so we're using four. We, we, were, we are asking a user to enter their percentage for test three. So we need to read that integer. We're not using this. We're exiting the program numerous occasions, so numerous uh, points in our program. So we're using system call code number 10. So it depends on what you're doing. Well, the difference is what you're printing. The difference is the data type you're printing. An integer is different from a string. An integer, how big is an integer in MIPS? 32 bits. How big is a string in MIPS? How big is a string in MIPS? We're going to bring this question in the exam, I guess people. Uh, yeah, we were, but how big is a string in MIPS? It's a, it's a, really, it's a, it's a question I'm asking. How big is a string in MIPS? If you're saying an integer is two bits in size, it's one word, how big is a string in MIPS? Five what? Sorry? <laughs> you're joking, are you? <laughs> four bytes, really? You're saying four bytes. Is your name even four bytes, right, in MIPS? The correct answer is uh, it depends. There's no end. I mean, it's, uh, you can have uh, a string that is what? That has 100 characters, 1,000 characters. Well, the, the limit is how much memory you have, I guess. Sir. Yes. Let's uh, use the official language. <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm very serious about this because, you know, the, interest, the interesting thing about what we're doing here, right? We are, pause for a little while here. You, you, might, you might think that this is, this is a joke, but there are people that don't know what you just said in here. They are, there are a lot of them actually. So, no, no, it's fine. I just wanted to put it out there. Uh -huh. On the integer, sir, I don't understand where the issue of the integer comes from. Since we said an integer is a value of a number, then I just want to say that there is an integer. What I see there, there are words, not an integer, more like a number. Which words? Yeah? Which words are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Well, but you're, co you're conflicting too many different things. You're, you're talking about an integer, and then you bring up the issue of a string. Okay, sir. To me, when I just hear the word integer, I think of the number. Exactly. Now, looking at the program that I'm programming, I don't see any number. So that's the issue that I'm having. What do you mean you don't see any number? Yeah. I try. All right, so there's a question for us. Do we now understand this uh, whole notion of, um, of conditional branches and unconditional branches? Yes. There's nothing to it now. One last part. Yeah. How do we now do the, for example, how we classify that, right? If we wanted to enter a grade, for example, like 69 or 70. Yeah. 
is it going to give us a fine grade for example maybe a B or C plus or something like that? If we enter 69. Because we are doing greater than, not the value itself. But we are doing greater than by taking into account those values. So if you, you can think of any number here, if we did the right thing, 69, what is 69? B. If we go here, um, whoa, 69 is B. The, the, the branching, the way you branch is dependent on what sort of logic you're attempting to implement. And how you do it is different, because people think differently. You have in your arsenal these different instructions that you can work with. Branch if less than, branch if equal to, branch if not equal to. You know, so it's, it's, it's on how you actually go about implementing it. You just ask yourself, you know, if you are trying to classify a grade, a, a score, whether it's an A plus or a D plus, without thinking about MIPS, how would you do it? How, how is it done? You look at the score. You compare the score against a certain threshold. If the score falls within this range, then? Now, if we had gotten to a stage where, um, yeah, I was going to say maybe we could use uh, logical operators, but it's fine. But is, is this making sense? Now, maybe we can, I know we are running out of time, but. Ooh, br branch if equal to. Mm, like for this problem, it would be, if we wanted to use branch if equal to, for this particular program, you just change the thresholds, right? If you remember our classification of A plus was using the value that's immediately less than the threshold, which is nine, which is why we're working with 89, because we know that from 89, we're going to move to 90. So branch if the number is greater than 89 meaning that the range you're going to be working with are numbers from 90 to 100. But if you wanted to use the equal to, you could just have said branch if greater, uh, greater than 90, and then you'd have another condition, which is branch if equal to 90. If you wanted to use this, these thresholds here, you'd have to have two separate instructions. Now here's a question for you, uh, as, as we part ways here, till we meet again, right? But look at this, if I run this, look at this, does this make sense? Are you, are you crazy right now? Is there a percentage which is? No, but it's doing that because it's Does this make sense? No, it doesn't. Doesn't make sense. So what I want you guys to do is think about how you can fix this, right? This is this 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 is wrong. Sorry? This is wrong. So uh, here's another way of looking at things. Does does um, let me just do that? Does this make sense? Negative fifty two. If I enter negative 52, nothing happens. Does that make sense? Does that make sense that nothing happens? What, what, what would make sense is you typing wrong value, enter the correct value or some, some, some crazy thing like that, right? So what I want you guys to do is just think about how we can do this. I mean, these are things, to, not that it matters, but just thought I'd point it out. I, I, I was so hoping we could cover loops here, uh, but we shall continue with loops on Friday. Sorry? We're meeting in here on Friday. <laughs> Sorry? You know, um, oh, shoot. The, uh, the, the thing with, the, the thing with life here is that and before we part ways here, the thing with life is you must understand, you must follow the rules, right? Rules are extremely important, which is why you're learning as a park here, by the way, because you're in part trying to, the rules are very important. Who told you that September 13th is a holiday? I'm a lecturer. 
Do you have that? Well, I mean, I'm not the other lecturer here. Have you, have you checked the calendar here? Have you looked at the number of days that you're supposed to have classes? If you count those number of days, do you think they take into account this thing? This is not a holiday. We shall have class and then you can go and run if you want to run after class. We have a class on Friday. See you at seven hours. Uh, now, as motivation, in class quiz on Friday. Yeah. 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 Thank you. See you. Yes, I have the class. Yes, that B, B, B label. Yeah. Does that now make it a It's a instruction. No. <laughs> there's no register here. Huh? There's, a, there's a very interesting question, right, from, from Brighton. Brighton was asking to say the B instruction, the so-called B instruction, is it a jump instruction because there are no registers? I told you guys, B is a classic example of a pseudo instruction. Because it's a pseudo instruction, where is B here? B should be somewhere here. I don't know if I have B somewhere. I guess I don't have B. Because it's a pseudo instruction, it's going to be evaluated to each bare instruction. So B is not a jump instruction. Yeah? No. I'll see you on, uh, well, when you see me.